In 1860, the ruler of a kingdom larger than France and Spain combined called for a crusade in the New World. But it was not a crusade of religion nor of conquest. It was a crusade against ignorance, against genocide. His was not a kingdom by birthright, nor did he take it with an army. He had arrived alone and conquered it with words. This was a kingdom where the subjects chose their ruler, and they chose him. In him lived their last major hope for salvation, and when he fell, two million native Mapuche fell with him, the mad king of Araucania, a Frenchman named Aurelie. As king of Araucania and Patagonia, I protest the violation of the rights of the people, the natural rights which they have by birth, rights which they can use and dispose of as they see fit. The Araucanians and Patagonians had the right to name me their king, and I had the right to accept the power which they conferred upon me, they who no nation had the power to stop. These are the words of Orly Antoine de Tunens, a man who history has all but forgotten. Modern historians declare him as an aberration, a sign of a changing times, but he was more than they give him credit for. In his life, he was raised up as a king and torn down as a madman. And although he spent time on the throne and in an asylum, neither was really true. He was an idealist fighting for peace. He was an egotist fighting for vanity. He was a lawyer fighting for the rights of the oppressed. He was a colonialist fighting for French domination of the world. But none of these can really describe him, and yet it would be hard to call any inaccurate. He was a strange man. And like all of us, he existed in a very strange time. By the mid-1800s, the genocide of the Americas was all but complete. In the North, Canada and America had swept to the Pacific, enlisting a mix of soldiers, settlers, and conscripted slaves to wipe out anyone who defied their rule. Those who trusted them were given blankets full of disease and brought to war against their colonial enemies. In Central and South America, independent states that had split off from early Spanish and Portuguese colonies worked their way in from the coasts, sending troops deep into the near impenetrable mountains and jungles that defined the continent's interior. Few had held back their advance. Those who had survived had done so through an unlikely mix of luck, determination, and near-constant war. In the lands we now called southern Chile and Argentina, some of the last major unconquered tribes stared down their inevitable fate. Chile had claimed their land as theirs, but had yet to take it. War was on the precipice. Soon, they knew that troops would be entering their villages, burning their homes to the ground, murdering their children, and decimating their society for good. They'd seen it before. It had happened to their ancestors, to their neighbors. It was happening still. And while for hundreds of years they'd been able to push them back just enough to survive, the time had come. Everyone knew it. The terror must have been unimaginable. The Mapuche are not a special people. Their society is not the epitome of greatness that we should all be aiming to achieve. They're normal, just like the rest of us, trying to cope with a world where their soldiers were less advanced than those of their enemies. And if they were to survive, something would have to change, and soon. They saw the need for a plan that hadn't been tried before, because war could no longer be the answer. Despite hundreds of years of holding back the enemy, the Mapuche knew this would not be a conflict that they would win. Anyone who might help them was already dead. Inevitably, they were going to be swallowed by the state, and there was virtually nothing they could do about it. As Chile geared up for one of the final conquests of the New World, a Frenchman decided he had a different plan. An adventurous lawyer with delusions of grandeur, he decided that he was going to save the Mapuche in a truly European way. He couldn't give them guns or money. He couldn't provide them with a stronger religion or better diseases. As he saw it, the way to save them from invasion was to make the invasion illegal. He would start a kingdom based around a modern constitution granting the people of Araucania rights derived by the state. In doing so, Chile could no longer claim the territory as their own, but be forced to invade them under the laws and restrictions of international warfare. That wasn't exactly an easy task, though. Not only would he have to convince the Mapuche to band together under his leadership, he'd also have to convince European and American governments to see his cause as legitimate, and neither of those was guaranteed. In fact, neither of them was even remotely likely. But Orly was nothing if not determined. 
He taught himself Mapudungan, the language of the Mapuche, and called together a meeting of tribal leaders to lay out his plan. In front of dozens of chiefs, he explained his vision for an independent French colonial monarchy centered around providing universal suffrage, human and civil rights, and freedom and equality for all individuals before the law. It would guarantee that indigenous people would hold the reins to their government with the ability to depose him should they find he wasn't willing to fulfill his promises. In turn, he got to be a king. Leaders from tribes across Araucania came together and agreed. They wouldn't exactly put their future in his hands, but there was little harm in letting him have his vanity. After all, perhaps this strange little Frenchman was on to something. Maybe by legitimizing themselves in the eyes of the law and putting a European face on their cause, they could get the invaders to see them as the human beings they knew themselves to be. Maybe even get the French army to take their side. Emboldened by their support, Aurélie named his kingdom New France and began setting out to provide the trappings of a real state. He minted coins, created a flag, wrote a constitution and a national anthem, proclaimed his capital, and undertook diplomatic efforts on behalf of his newfound subjects. As word spread, Patagonian tribes asked to join the cause, nearly tripling the land under his presumed control. In doing so, he now resided over one of the largest states on earth, at least on paper. But the international community wasn't willing to accept his kingdom. It had no army, no real administration, and for the most part existed entirely in his mind. It wasn't a state, it was a story. The French laughed in his face and publicly called him insane. They had no interest in promoting a precedent that might endanger their already teetering colonial empire. The Chilean and Argentinian press viciously campaigned against him, turning his name into an international joke. Nobody was willing to take him seriously. Nobody, that is except the Chilean government. As a nation at war with the Mapuche, they alone understood the danger he posed. From the very beginning, they sent spies to watch his movements and relay information back to the military in Santiago. They weren't going to risk a French incursion into lands they believed rightfully theirs, and more than that, had no interest in seeing a unified indigenous state in an area that they'd already divided up in their minds. In 1862, they had him arrested, put on trial, and declared insane. He was locked away in an asylum and nearly died of starvation until France repatriated him. Three times he would return to his people in Araucania, smuggling weapons and attempting to restart the foundations of the state, and three times he would be returned to France. He would never be the hero the Mapuche needed. In 1878, penniless and alone, he died in the Dordogne. His kingdom wouldn't mourn the loss. They had far larger problems to face than the long-forgotten whimsy of a failed savior. But to me, the one thing that stands out most about this story is the question, was he insane? Because it's considered that way right up to the modern day, and yet it's such a fine line, particularly when you note that the people who were sourcing this information from completely disagreed with his view of the world. In slave culture, John Brown must have seemed insane. In Canada, Louis Riel was framed by his mania. In the modern American political climate, there are bumper stickers calling liberalism a mental disorder. And yet, we'd all agree that Timothy McVeigh was insane. I think most of us would say that ISIS has no rational basis in reality. Standing up to an imperfect status quo does not by definition make you of sound mind. The pendulum swings both ways. It certainly takes a different type of personality to die for something virtually nobody in their community agrees with. So the main question to me is if he acted out of conscience or vanity. Was he a lawyer pushing for freedom or a wannabe king manipulating the downtrodden so he could claim he had subjects? We'll likely never know. And because of that, I'd argue that the way his story is framed will always say more about the storyteller's bias than the reality of his regency. The Mapuche lost the war. Their kingdom and the society of millions beneath it are now helmed by European-led states. The world moved on without Orali. His ideals have been lost to the sea of time, but there will always be people like him. As long as there are causes to fight for, we will find those who push back against the society they live in to take up those causes. And I suspect we'll call them insane, whether they are or not. This is Rare Earth. Mari Mari Peñi, Mari Mari la mien.
Mari Mari Compuché, eh, Comer Calacay. Yo te estoy diciendo en español, buenos días hermanos, buenos días hermanas los presentes, buenos días a todos los visitantes. Eh, ¿Cómo estás tú? Te pregunté en Mapuche. ¿Comer Calacay? ¿Tú Comer Calacay, dice.